Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Very good afternoon. I'm Polly Middlehurst with your GB News at four o'clock. Doctors have advised the Prime Minister that 90% of people being treated in intensive care haven't received their COVID booster jabs. Speaking at a vaccination centre, Boris Johnson said 2.4 double jab people hadn't had their booster and he's urging them to get the jabs so they can enjoy the new year. The latest figures show more than 800,000 boosters were recorded across the UK during the five-day Christmas period. Meanwhile, some pharmacies are reporting a huge problem with a shortage of lateral flow tests, saying there were requests every five minutes over Christmas for sets. The Association of Independent Multiple Pharmacies is warning of patchy supplies following a change in self-isolation rules from 10 to 7 days if someone tests negative. The UK Health Security Agency says the delivery capacity for testing kits has doubled to 900,000 a day since mid-December. And in Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon says she won't introduce further coronavirus restrictions because hospital cases have remained broadly stable. The First Minister says she expects a steep increase in cases over the coming weeks, however. Scots are also being urged not to travel to England for New Year's Eve, where clubs are still open. And it's also why over Hogmanay and New Year's Day, and for at least the first week of January, we are advising everyone to stay at home more than normal, to reduce contacts with people outside our own households, and to limit the size of any indoor social gatherings that do take place so that they do not include people from any more than three households. Meanwhile, in France, every second, two people are testing positive for COVID. That's according to the country's health minister, Olivier Véran, who also said France had reported a record daily high of 208,000 new cases. That's up from 180,000 on Tuesday. Meanwhile, the World Health Organization director, General Tedros Ghebreyesus, says he's becoming increasingly concerned by the global cases. Delta and Omicron are twin threats that are driving up cases to record numbers. I'm highly concerned that Omicron, being more transmissible, circulating at the same time as Delta, is leading to a tsunami of cases. More than 100 cases of harassment and stalking have been reported in Parliament since the start of last year. The figures come from the Met's Parliamentary Liaison and Investigation Team, which was set up following the murder of the MP Joe Cox. It recorded 117 cases between January last year and September this year. The social care system is not fit for purpose and is handing some children over to criminal gangs. That's according to a new report. The Commission on Young Lives says many teenagers are moved away from where they live and sometimes end up in areas with high levels of crime. The Department for Education says it is urgently reforming the system to address growing pressures. Insulate Britain's protests have cost the taxpayer at least £4.3 million. The group blocked motorways for the three months, calling on the government to cut carbon emissions by insulating homes. The Metropolitan Police spent bulk of money with over 6,600 officers and staff. The Transport Secretary Grant Shapp said he was appalled by the bill. That's your latest news update. I'm back in an hour with more. See you then. It's time to remind ourselves, there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hello there, an exceptionally mild end to 2021. Breezy at times with some outbreaks of rain or courtesy of an area of low pressure. 
Lots of isobars covering the country, which means it will continue to be windy, with a succession of weather fronts moving up from the southwest, hence the reason why the air is so mild. But that does mean as we head through Wednesday and into Thursday, further spells of rain are likely, again, moving up from the southwest. A strong wind pretty much wherever you are, and this rain could turn heavy through the early hours of the morning for northern England, the Midlands, East Anglia, as well as Wales. More heavy rain to come, particularly over the highlands of Scotland. Now, as we head into Thursday, it will be mild and it will be a windy start to the morning. Now, through the morning, you can see this rain continues its passage eastwards. So clearing Wales through the latter part of the morning into the afternoon. And we'll see some brighter skies, particularly for Antrim and down. Northern Ireland seeing more cloud towards the southwest. And brighter skies, Aberdeenshire, down towards borders as well as Northumberland. Always more rain, though, arriving across Wales, the Midlands, as well as the West Country later on in the day. And look at that breeze. It's going to be windy wherever you are, quite gusty, particularly over the hills and mountains. But it will be mild. And then through a Thursday evening into New Year's Eve, that rain continues its passage northwards. Again, it's likely to be heavy in places, particularly for Northern Ireland and Scotland through the latter part of the night. And rain returns towards the west later on and into New Year's Eve. So the first part of the New Year's Eve, um, as we head to the last day of 2021, will be wet and windy for some. However, through the day, the rain will wane, it will ease. Still some lingering on across northern England, but a brighter end to the year across the north as well as the south and west. And temperatures holding up. So that leads into New Year's Day. Fine for most, some sunshine, but still rather windy. And temperatures on the mild side. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Twenty twenty one is drawing to a close. Thank goodness, I'm sure many will say. Rather like twenty twenty, another year that somewhat blurs because of a stop start nature of the pandemic. Perhaps this year not quite as bad as last. One big event this year, of course, was on the twentieth of June, twenty twenty one, a new political programme on GB News started called The Political Correction. And I was there with Deanna, with Paul, and Arlene joined us shortly thereafter. We're gonna have a look back at 2021, about the big things that happened. What happened in politics in 2021? Was it a year in which we began to lose faith once again in our elected representatives? What a year for the royal family. I mean, the death of Prince Philip, uh, Megxit uh, fully completed, much to discuss there. COVID, of course, dominated so much of our lives. And as the year ends, some quite dire predictions of where we could go over the course of the next few months. And for every house in the land, for the first time in 40 years, inflation is back and people are seeing it. The cost of living's rising, their taxes are about to go up. The economy suddenly got very real again. And of course, on the world stage, Joe Biden, the 46th president of the USA, the Afghanistan debacle, and we end the year with 100,000 Russian troops lined up on the Ukrainian border. Arlene Foster. At the beginning of 2021, you were the First Minister of Northern Ireland. And you finished the year without that heavy responsibility. You're here with us at GB News, which, yeah. we're, which we're thrilled. I mean, when the year started in January mm. and you were talking about lockdowns mm. in Northern Ireland and you were laying down the law that, <laughs> that people were going to be locked down until... Yeah. I think it was at least March you were talking about being yeah. locked down until, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, Nigel, it's been a year I'll not forget in a hurry. It's been, to quote Dickens, the best of times. It's been the worst of times, <laughs> if I can say it in that fashion. Sometimes I use that phrase to describe mandatory coalition in Northern Ireland, actually. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I started the year as a first minister um, very quickly in April. Uh, there was a heave against me instead of trying to stay and fight, I said, look, it's time to do something different. And that something different is here. And um, frankly, the change into having these sorts of discussions is a new challenge. Uh, I'm really enjoying it, but it just goes to show that you need to have more than just a political life. You need to have mm. a, a bigger story to tell. And I'm really enjoying 
being here and being with you guys every Sunday. But it, I mean, was it, you know, when the year started, mm. you know, you imagined you'd still be there? Oh, absolutely. I mean, nobody foresees that sort of end, but I mean, we all know that politics and political leadership always has to come to an end. Mm. Mine ended a little bit more quickly, I think, no, than uh, I... a lot of people would have predicted, including myself. But you know what? <laughs> It's fine. You have to take it and move on to the next thing because you can either take it in one of two ways. You can either become very bitter and insular mm, about mm, the issue mm. or you can say, well, if that's what you want, that's fine. I'll move on and do something else. No, and things change. I mean, Deanna, yeah, absolutely. you know, in January of this year, you were a Boris Johnson loyalist. <laughs> You're implying I'm not a Boris Johnson loyalist at the moment. It doesn't look either. like it. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a difference, isn't there, between rebelling on policy yeah. and kind of taking a stance yeah. against the leader. I think the two things are very different and should be kept very distinct. Um, but it's been a tough year. I mean, I don't envy the Prime Minister, the job he's had, you know, trying to govern mm. COVID as, as one thing in and of mm. itself is really difficult. Um, he's been sort of trying to continue with the Brexit negotiations, which I know you would argue should have been completed before we left. But still, I think Absolutely. trying to get that deal over the line in time and get it over the line with kind of a new parliament was really important. Yeah, I don't envy the man at all. He's had a really, a really rough ride, but it's not been easy for we back then well, either. I think leadership's always tough. Mm. And, you yeah. Know, but the big political change in January, I guess, wasn't here. Mm. It was in America. Mm -hmm. And it was the inauguration of Joe Biden. And there he was. America is back. We're rejoining the global community. It was a... Paul, what was that? Was that a return to the old ways of doing things? Does it mean that Trump was just an aberration? Or... Is Joe Biden the aberration? I think that the Democrats and I think generally the left across the world and the liberal community across the world do see Trump still as an aberration. Mm. They think that American voters took leave of their senses mm. and they voted in someone who wasn't fit to, to govern and now the normal order of things has been restored. Now, I mean, I have no time for Trump as a person, particularly. I'm not. I'm not his greatest fan by any stretch. Oh, he's a great guy. Great guy. Great guy. Well, I knew you would say that. Of course, <laughs> you've got an exclusive interview no, no, with him. You've absolutely. got to butter him up naturally. But the, the truth was, he did speak for millions of people yeah. left behind America. He spoke yeah. for working class Americans. Um, whether or not his policies would benefit them in the long run, they saw him as speaking for their interests. You know, provincial America. Mm -hmm. And I think the danger really for the for the Democrats is that they think that, you know, it's just now normal service again um, and that the election of Biden will naturally heal the wounds. Yeah. I don't think it has healed the wounds. Yeah. I think the divisions that existed under Trump are still there. I think the left behind communities of America who have been affected by globalization in a big way and who look to Trump as some sort of savior still feel the way they did. So in terms of the divisions across the United States, I think we're going to still see those playing mm. out for some years to come. It's very interesting because that narrative that Trump was a short-term aberration, the voters have taken leave of their senses, is exactly what Blair and others, your former leader, Thanks. and others. <laughs> By the way, are there any Labour leaders you have liked in the last 25 oh, years? Now, I know we're going Atlee. back a few years. God, none of us. Now, I wasn't born then. I know we're going back a few years. <laughs> I mean, if Same you look at the, I said we'd get on to talking about the war, and we have. I mean, at the, 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 I think the Labour government of 45 was a radical reforming government that did a huge amount of good for this country. And, you know, if you said to me who's the best Labour leader of all time, I think I would say Clement Attlee. I mean, look, Blair did some really good things. If you're, if you're on the left, as I am, you look at the investment in schools and hospitals and so on, um, then, then you have to pat him on the back. But I don't think that Blair challenged the, the economic consensus in this country. I don't think he shifted the balance of wealth and power in favour of ordinary working people. Well, the opposite. Which, well, exactly. And with a 179-seat majority, which he had in 97, he had every opportunity um, to do that. Um, so, look, I, I, don't, I don't condemn him, but he, he is certainly part of that group of people who embraced the global market and what all of that meant for working class. I was teasing you. I was teasing a bit. I was teasing you. So, the end of February, I, I think it is that miserable month. The weather can be at its worst. The days are still incredibly short. Uh, it's merciful that it only lasts 28 days in the minds of many people. And this year, it was February in lockdown. Any thoughts back on how grim February was for your constituents? It feels so long ago, doesn't it? Yeah, sort of weird. 10 months and it feels forever. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it was really difficult, particularly because we were in this lockdown and we saw no light at the end of the tunnel. There was no kind of exit plan really at that point. We didn't know what was going to happen next. We didn't know what was going to unlock, whether kids would be able to kind of properly go back to school, whether 
hospitality businesses were going to properly reopen, whether they'd survive. Um, it was really difficult. So much uncertainty, I think, is kind of a theme of, of this year in some ways, but particularly in that early stage of the year. Firstly, when it's long, dark nights, mm. the weather's rubbish mm. anyway, and you're mm. stuck at home, can't even go down the pub for a pint kind of thing. It was it just so fe- it, it did feel like, didn't it? It did feel like the horizon was a very, very yeah. long way away. Yeah. It was a pretty dark time, but look, um, I think the move then towards dealing with is there a route out of lockdown we were all told the vaccine was the route out of lockdown no doubt we'll return to that uh, later on in the program uh, i remember making those statements as well as all the other uh, devolved leaders urging people to get their vaccine because that was the route out and actually you know we were doing rather well with vaccine rollout weren't we i mean this was one thing this was one thing brexiteers could say ha uh-huh. 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 you know because if we'd been part of the european union there was a failed conservative politician from Cyprus Mm -hmm. who was in charge of the rollout. And one of the things number 10 got right Mm -hmm. was to appoint this remarkable woman, Mm -hmm. Kate Bingham, who'd been successful in private business before, who did the job for six months and then left. I mean, mean, he really got that right, didn't Mm -hmm. he? Completely. I mean, you know, involving the private sector in the way that we did, basically saying, we'll we'll foot the bill if you can make it happen. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely the right approach. And the Mm -hmm. speed of that rollout was really phenomenal, particularly, you know, comparing it to other sort of nearby neighbours, really quite astonishing. And I think it really gave the nation hope. I think that's probably coming towards the end of February. I think that's probably what I remember the most was the hope of yeah. how well the vaccination programme was going, but also hope from having this four stage plan of this is how we are going to get past this. This is how we are going to emerge from this really dark period. So in March, many of us with utter horror, Deanna, watch the Harry and Meghan show. Mm-hmm. Some of us didn't. Well, the- <laughs> no, <laughs> what, okay. what, you didn't watch it? No, I did not. <laughs> Well, oh, I absolutely did. not. Well, I, I have to say I did. Mm, me too. Um, it was extraordinary because it struck me that it was an all-out attack on the institution itself. It's, it's how it felt watching it, and I think you know, in Britain, we the the vast majority of people have so much respect mm. and outright respect for the, the royal family and the institution. That to see that, I think, for a lot of people, was quite shocking. Do we respect the royal family? Or do we respect the Queen? I think a lot of that is the Queen. I mean, her her sense of duty and public service throughout her incredibly mm. long reign is astonishing. You know, I can't think of anyone else who better sums up that notion of public service. Than, yeah, I mean, she, it has been remarkable. I mean, I, I know that Paul would rather have President Kinnock. Um, than, <laughs> um, but, At least you can get rid of him. But, that, but isn't that what no, it would no, be? Well, no, I don't agree with that. I mean, I think Her Majesty the Queen has been an incredible uh, matriarch of the family. But are you seriously saying that there are other members of the family that don't do good? Look at Princess Anne, my mm. goodness. The amount of work that she does in a very uncelebrated way, a very unglitzy way. She gets on with it. She does it, as indeed do many other members of the family. So, I mean, I do think it's wrong to just say you know, um, that it's just the Queen, that's not I, true, but... I think she, she comes from a certain era mm. and she represents a certain tradition, that kind of... No, it is service. Stiff upper lip. Yeah, yeah. Duty, Duty, service, mm. loyalty yeah, to, yeah. to country. Yeah. Never explain, um, never complain. All, yeah. of, all of that. that. And yeah. I think that's the part of the institution that the public respects, and I think she carries that off mm. very well. Um, as I said, if you're going to have a monarch, then she's probably as mm-hmm. good a monarch as you're going to get. Well, do you know what? Through the centuries, the royal family has been through extraordinary exactly. ups and downs. And actually, we we forget that republicanism in this country, uh, you know, in, in terms of changing it from monarchy to republic, has probably been at its lowest levels for centuries. Now, trust in the police is obviously a really, really important issue. The shocking discovery of the murder of Sarah Everard back in March and you know the body being found down in these woods near Ashford in Kent. The fact that Wayne Cousins, a serving police officer, who who actually been, you know, at a very high level, a, a gun carrying police officer, had been responsible, uh, was clearly an awful case. I just wondered, looking back at that, did anything positive come out of it? I, I think one of the positive things, if you can see it as such, was how it gave so many other predominantly young women the confidence to actually come out and speak about their own experiences to help shed some light on how big an issue kind of sexual violence against women is. Because a lot of people keep it quiet. They're ashamed to speak up. They think that they might be 
kind of victim shamed or whatever it might be for actually speaking out about their own experiences. But so many people found the bravery to do that, which has led to actually some big changes some big changes in government, more money going to local councils to tackle this stuff, the development of a new app so women can pinpoint areas where they don't feel safe. So resource can go into those areas and a much wider recognition of how big an issue this is. You know, I had male friends of mine say to me, I had no idea you had to go through that so regularly. It was a very difficult situation because, of course, the circumstances of the murder was just so evil. I mean, the man stopped her, arrested her, mm. and then abducted her. And I mean, obviously, when you and I were growing up, Nigel, the police were figures of authority and people had respect for them. And I think one of the things I was really struck by was actually the loss of authority for police officers and, and events like this actually add to all of that. You know, you can't trust the police. And we've been through moments like that in the past, whether it's been racism or homophobia, mm -hmm. and now we were with it in terms of violence against women and girls. And it was just so shocking at the time. It was, it was absolutely horrendous. Um, but I think it, the point needs to be made even now that it was a very, very isolated mm, incident. I mean, it was unprecedented yeah. for a yeah. police officer to abduct a woman from the street and then... It's so hard to say that. ...go and murder. Well, 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 it shouldn't be. But, because but at the time, to say that, no, it was it, almost as if you were complicit. Per you know. Perhaps it was, but it was... It was clearly, or belittling the issue. It was yeah. clearly an isolated yeah. incident. And my, my fear at the time and now is that we then create this climate where we tell women in this country to be distrustful yeah. of police officers. Now, I've got a daughter and I would like to think that if my daughter is walking the streets at night and she feels threatened or something and she sees a police officer, that she would be comfortable yeah. about approaching that police officer and asking for assistance. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Join us for the political correction. We're here every Sunday to correct politics and put you, the people, back in charge. We talk about all areas of the United Kingdom, including Northern Ireland. Our debate goes way beyond the Westminster Village. It's about the real country. It's about your opinion. So please, we want you to tell us what you think. This is the political correction. Every Sunday morning from 10 a.m. here on GB News. You're watching GB News Live across the UK, the world and our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We're here for you. Don't forget to join our community by hitting the subscribe button. And download the GB News app so you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you. Email us at gbviews at gbnews.uk. Thanks for being part of the GB News family.
And then we got to April and I think the first kind of major thing to happen in April was the very tragic death of Prince Philip. Yeah. Yeah. Which, you know, we knew he was of age, we knew he was unwell, but still I think it came as a huge shock to the nation, didn't it? I deserted the country by then. I'd had enough. I couldn't see lockdown ever ending. Mm. Uh, And I left uh, in early April. Um, I had to do a two-week quarantine in the Caribbean. Before, oh no! Before oh, getting it's hard life. <laughs> Stop. Stop. Before Stop. getting into America, so I was away, <laughs> I was away for two months. What was really interesting, what was being in the Caribbean when the news of, of Philip's mm. death came through, and being over there, a couple of things struck me. You know, um, this was a former British colony, and you know, taxi drivers, despite the fact they would sort of got their independence years ago, still talking about my queen. Mm. That connection was remarkable. But they would have remembered Philip and... And, and of course, he them. was yeah. a respected figure, mm. you know, mm-hmm. distinguished service, mm. mentioned in dispatches World War II, been there all the way through the whole thing. So I was very struck by that. I suppose my, my, my abiding memory of it, apart from being over there, just watching the Queen on her own in Absolutely. that chapel. I just... I mean, Keir Starmer since has talked about it as, 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 as sh- giving an example to the nation... Of how to of how to deal with social distancing rules, I thought it was quite hard to watch. Incredibly she hard so to tiny. watch, didn't she? I mm. thought she looked so small yeah. in her little seat in that huge building. I it it was heartbreaking actually. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I just thought it was really really sad. It was, it was. I mean, in many respects, again, I say this as someone who's not a royalist, but it was the end of an era. It mm. was mm-hmm. the end of a certain type of royal, wasn't it? The mm. stiff upper upper lip, mm. duty, tradition. Etc. The famous British Reserve. That is what mm. Prince Philip embodied. Um, never explain, never complain. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? What struck me actually was his wartime service. I mean, he mm. genuinely did have a distinguished war record. And as you said, yeah. Nigel mentioned in dispatches, this wasn't somebody who just kind of signed up nominally because it looked good on the record. This mm. was somebody who was on the front line mm-hmm. in the Royal Navy yeah. mm-hmm. and was, was you know, facing um, German aeroplanes coming over and yeah. trying to, and to was, bomb and the Yeah, and of course wanted to pursue a naval career. So he yeah. marries the young princess. Yeah. He marries the young princess. And when they got married, 1947 they got married, he had every logical yeah. reason to think they'd have 25 years married, before it was her turn to become the monarch. Mm. And he was going to pursue his naval career and he had ambitions to go all the way to be an admiral. And of course, King George VI dies at 56 years old Mm -hmm. and suddenly she's thrust into the position of being queen. And he effectively has to to give up his life. And and Mm -hmm. had no idea at that stage. He, um, He gave an interview I saw where he said he had no idea at that stage what his role was actually going to be. Because mm-hmm. uh, I think the last person who found himself in that position was probably Prince Albert at the, mm-hmm. uh, at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so he said, you know, there was nobody who came in and gave him a brief and said, this is what you had to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he said, I had to make it up as I, as I went along. Uh, and he pursued his particular causes that, that he was passionate about. Um, but again, if you're going to have a Queen's consort, then he would be as good as an example, I think. Yeah. As, as he, I mean, I, I thought it was incredible. And during the run-up to the funeral, we learned so much about Prince Philip that a lot Mm -hmm. of people hadn't Mm. known about. I mean, Mm. his breadth of involvement in the Mm. World Wildlife Fund, the Mm. fact that he was there at the very beginning. You then start to think, oh, Charles is getting his environmental credentials actually Mm. from his father, who was interested in all of that at the very Mm. beginning. So I I thought it was an incredible life. My goodness, well-lived, filled with activity not just lounging around and being the Queen's concert, but actually purposeful Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and really full. The great thing about him to a certain degree is he was unreconstructed, oh, wasn't yes, he? Yes. You know, he wouldn't have had any time, yeah. he didn't have any time for, for wokery mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. pouring out your feelings on national mm-hmm. television. You know, he, he would have, I think, really oh, opposed all of that and did oppose all well, of that sort of stuff. He was old and school. that's the kind, if we're going to have a monarchy, that's the sort of monarchy he was, <laughs> him, he was old school. And very interestingly, you know, here we are, December, the end of the year. Tom Bauer, you know, who, who is mm. a, a shrewd observer of people. Um, and of course, writes these biographies mm. and a lot of them are, you know, big best-selling books. And he, he's said in the last week that he thinks Prince Philip not being there actually is one of the reasons that the wheels are coming off the firm. 
mm. at the firm as the royal family. Mm. And no, and if you look at it, I mean, then goodness me, they have got problems in all sorts mm. of directions. Mm -hmm. and, and it was interesting, even, even you know, learning years later, that even in her great difficulty, Diana yes. felt mm. he was somebody who could be a trusted confidant mm -hmm. to go and sit, sit down with her. And so we sort of speculated already about what, you know, the Queen's role is, and, and we don't like to talk about it, but what yeah. might happen if she's not here. But maybe he's actually a bigger loss to the institution than perhaps we've recognised today. Yeah. Well, speaking about one institution and moving to a different one that I think, Paul, you might be a bit more interested in, we hit stage three of Unlock, and finally you could go and absolutely freeze your bum <laughs> off sitting in a beer garden. Oh, yeah. With a number of friends. Uh, yeah. And I must admit, that first pint on 12th of April, <laughs> he was fine, he was fine. I'm talking to you guys here. That, that first pint, 12th of April, scarf, hat, gloves on everything was so worth it. Some comical memes where oh, yeah. <laughs> the rain and sleep oh, yes, coming and down oh, yeah. and all the rest of it. But, but people did it because I think they felt so cooped up yeah. for so long. Absolutely. That suddenly given the opportunity to break free from those restrictions, even if it was minus five, wherever they were, they thought, well, that's it, I'm going down the pub and I'm having a pint of lager. Yeah. So we come to May, the story of the inquiry by Lord Dyson into the events surrounding the interview by Martin Bashir of mm. Princess Diana in 1995 and, and found that he was guilty of deceit in the way that he conducted that interview. That was a bit of a hammer blow for the for the BBC, wasn't it, Arlene? I mean, it, it, was was it a nail in the coffin of the BBC? Do you think? Well, not a nail in the coffin, but I think it was certainly the start of a conversation about the BBC. I mean, up until then, the BBC, even with Savile and everything else, you know, it was still seen to be the institution um, that it always has been, Lord Wreath's institution, as it were. But I think now, and certainly in the latter half of the year. People are starting to say to look at the BBC and and ask more questions than they have ever done before, and Bashir himself has continued to fall, as we've seen just very recently, uh, in relation to all of this. So, I mean, there are huge questions about the BBC, and more and more, I am meeting people who are talking about why are we paying a license fee to these people when they're not impartial? They're supposed to be an impartial organisation. They're not impartial. And more and more people are having that conversation. I mean, I, I was struck by an interview that Andrew Marr, of all people, I mean, mm. a BBC man through and through, obviously, gave a few years ago, where he said that the, the, the BBC as an institution is infused with cultural liberalism and it mm. sees everything through that, through that prism. I mean, I'm, I'm, I love the BBC. I'm a BBC man, although I accept that it has got major, major problems uh, and, and doesn't speak for many parts of, of our country. You'd probably like to defund the BBC completely and get rid of it. I, Paul, I have grown up with the BBC. Yeah, as we of all have. Of course I have. As we um, all have. I've been a news hound all my life. You must love Test Match Special you know, as a BBC institution. My greatest honour, forget meeting you know, the Pope and the Dalai Lama really? and Donald Trump and forget all that. <laughs> I was, that, that was a good party that night. I was guest of the day with Jonathan Agnew on Test Match Special, on Saturday lunch during a Test Match. I mean, I've listened to Test Match Special for 50 years. Of course, there are bits of the BBC I've grown up with, yeah. Yeah. bits of it I love, and I still think around the world, uh, particularly through BBC World Service, mm. it's still actually, in terms of our push, and our reach as a country is terribly important. So look, I still think the BBC is part of, of, of the Global Britain brand. Mm. I wouldn't abolish it altogether. I really, really wouldn't. But I don't really see why uh, the BBC is allowed, for example, on FM radio, to hold these vast bandwidths mm. that keep everybody else out. Now, by the way, GB News, of course, is going out in the new year mm -hmm. on Absolutely. DAB, which is an exciting new development. Um, so they've still got some very big inbuilt privileges and advantages. I personally think the BBC licence fee should either be abolished completely or reduced down to a minimal 30, yeah. sort of 30, 35 pounds a year. So Arlene, June 2021, a very dramatic moment in your life. Well, obviously in April, I had declared my intention to resign as First Minister because there'd been a push against me 
was in the Democratic mm -hmm. Unionist Party. So on the 14th of June, I stepped down as First Minister of Northern Ireland. I mean, it had been a huge privilege and pleasure to be the First Minister of Northern Ireland. Obviously for me, coming mm. from Northern Ireland, a Northern mm. Ireland girl, it had been wonderful. But it came to an end on the 14th of June in 2021. How did it feel waking up on the 15th of June? Oh my goodness, I hadn't thought about that before. <laughs> Do you know what? In many ways, you either treat it and, and you get really down about these things because you've reached the, the top position in Northern Ireland and now you're no longer in that position. I actually found it quite liberating um, mm. because there had been incredible pressure around COVID-19 and doing the right thing. And mm. were we doing the right thing in relation to businesses and people's health care and all of that? So actually, 15th of June was okay. Was, was Enoch Powell right when he said that all political careers end in failure? I'm not saying your career ended so, in failure, by the way, but that's what he said. He's misquoted on this. He is, is I he? think, yeah. He said mm. all political careers end in failure unless they are cut off midstream. Mm. I'm convinced, oh, right. you I'm were convinced cut off clearly, <laughs> weren't you, Arnie? I'm convinced that Tony Blair had that in his mind when he got out. Yeah. Because Blair got out, if you think about it, Within a year, the financial crash could happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, Blair got out at the top. So mm. that was the point that he made. If you keep going in politics forever, in the end, mm. in the end, it's going to be very tough and very, very difficult. Yeah, and I mean, all political careers and all political leadership times come to an end. I mean, that's the reality of the situation. And I think if you're in a situation of political leadership, you know that it's for a limited period of time. Yeah. You know it's not going to go on forever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, you're you do your best when you're in the position, and then when you're not in the position, you move on, you do something different. It's, well, a, bit, it's a bit like football managers, isn't it? Mm. Very rarely do they leave the job to the applause of, yeah. of, yeah. of fans and they hardly people ever do. cheering them to the rafters. Yeah. They, they usually it's go. It's retrospective. Of course, they usually yeah. go because people have had enough of them, to be honest, yeah. and they've they yeah. no, edged them out. It's, it's, well, that was, yeah. of course, another departure. In June, wasn't that? Well, it was, but June was slightly more got... dramatic <laughs> departure. Do you think Matt... it was more dramatic than me? <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot more visible. <laughs> I mean, it's Matt Hancock month, isn't it? Yeah. Because we kicked yeah. the month off with the announcement that there were zero COVID deaths. That's wow. Yeah. Yeah. Which, yeah. Hooray. Yeah. Was... And it's all Incredible. looking good. And we know that the easing, you know, Freedom Day is, is coming. Yeah. And it takes longer to come than we want. Yeah, we've got a bit know. of a delay, but still. But it we know it's coming. Yeah. And then, of course, it finishes up with Hancock the Snogger. <laughs> and all the rest snogger of it. Cautious snogging. <laughs> yeah, that video. It haunts me. Not, it haunts me to Not much so as much as it haunts him. <laughs> yeah. I think the, the you know, the thing about the video, I have no interest in Matt Hancock's personal life at all. But again, as we've discussed on the show many mm. times, it's the hypocrisy thing. Yeah. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. 
and something else. I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. So normally on the 11th of July, guys, I'm busy preparing for the 12th, but <laughs> this year um, my sister was home from England and the TV was on. It must have been a devastating 11th of July, Paul. Well, it was. It was the, um, the Euro 2020, which obviously was, yeah. uh, was delayed for, for a year. And we'd waited so long since 1966, of course, for England to win a major football competition. And when the England team is doing well, it does manage to, to unite the nation almost in a way that nothing else ever can, really. And Freedom Day came on the 19th then, Deanna, it is. in terms of COVID. But seeing the pure look of joy on people's faces, I was still quite cautious. I was still lateral flow testing like mm. three, four times a week at that point, just, just to be safe. And so I knew that I if the test was to be believed, didn't have any signs of COVID. It was just amazing. It really felt like normality. So high summer comes, August, and for the first time really in 2021, international affairs mm. impinge upon us. The 46th president of the USA, Joe Biden, known by some as Sleepy Joe, decides he is unilaterally going to withdraw the remaining 3,000 troops from Afghanistan. Now, you know, for lots of us, we were thinking, why the hell have we been there for 20 years? Yeah. Although what I did learn was that actually since 2014, the Americans and the Brits had been, had been providing backup support. The fighting was being done by the Afghan army itself. Anyway, Biden decides they're out, does it with no consultation with us whatsoever. No consultation with NATO. Uh, it leaves the British government in a bind. We kind of have no option yeah. but to get out as well. And here we are, you know, several months down the road. Um, the Taliban are back in charge. Donald Trump is banned from Twitter. The Taliban leadership is still active on Twitter. The broader question, I guess, is the whole kind of principle, the policy of, yeah. of interventionism, liberal interventionism in other countries, does it work? Can we bomb countries into democracy? Can we, by military no. force, turn countries into yeah. the type of countries that we want to see and we want to, <coughs> to live with? Or are we better off just saying, look, we probably are just better off out of this? I mean, the devastating thing, I think, for particularly women and girls in Afghanistan is that they were given a view of what could be. Yes. And they mm. started to go into education. They started to appear on television. We have a number of females who are elected as parliamentarians. They're all in hiding now. Mm -hmm. mm. Most of them are out of the country, living in exile in Greece and places like that. I think there's only a number of, the, a very small number of them still in Afghanistan, but in hiding. Let's be clear about that. So they're, it's almost as if they're shown what it could be, and then yeah. it's taken yeah. away from them. So we move on to September. And we learn that the government is going to raise national insurance by 1.25% to, uh, to, to pay for social care reforms. Pretty controversial, Deanna, wasn't it? It was. It was, um, you know, on, on the one hand, actually tackling social care was a really big deal. Mm. This is something where the can's been kicked down the road for so long by so many successive governments to actually try and grasp and tackle this, this issue where we do have an ageing population and the cost of social care needs, needs addressing. But to do it with a plan that probably won't necessarily tackle the issues in the long run and by raising taxes when people are already facing a massive kind of cost of living hit, to me seemed um, pretty unreasonable. So I became a, a rebel for the second time in my parliamentary career, winning lots of favours with party <coughs> whips at the moment. But it was, it was a small rebellion. I expected a lot more. There was a lot of anger amongst the backbenchers. Mm. Ever since the Tories have been in, the tax squeeze on the middle mm. has been utterly astonishing and yet on the lowest know. earners there have been massive tax savings yeah i think you know the, i i think diana i think the 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 increase um in the levels at which people should start to be taxed and i'd campaigned for that for years and thrilled to see it uh but but the squeeze middle 
is now squeezed in quite a remarkable way. But it raises a bigger question. Is this even a Conservative Party? You know, it's a party that's obsessed uh, with all sorts of liberal um, ideas. Uh, the obsession with climate change, the obsession that we must make people pay 10,000 quid for new heat pumps in their mm. homes and everything else and COP26. So it's green, it's uber liberal, and now it raises taxes. And they carry on with this charade that we're the party of low taxes. And that, interestingly, interestingly, this was the moment I think this was the mm. moment. No, I think you're right. That the yeah. real conversation mm. about what is the Conservative Party under Boris Johnson began. It wasn't really there before that. But ever since that moment, it has. And it's led us right through uh, to where we are today and to various rebellions today. It was always, I mean, Arling, it was always the Conservative and Unionist yeah. Party, wasn't it? I mean, you're a unionist. Do you... Do, do you associate with the Conservative Party? Do you, can you see yourself aligning with today's Conservative Party? Well, of course, we have the Northern Ireland Protocol, which we haven't touched on um, in this programme yet. And it was around this time that the pressure started to look at Article 16. Of course, the command paper came out in July saying that the circumstances were there to trigger Article 16 to bring the protocol back into negotiations. It still hasn't been triggered. And actually, I think Boris is missing a trick here now because he should be triggering it and saying, I'm standing up for the union. This is something I really do believe in. And therefore, I'm triggering Article 16 because the internal market of the United Kingdom has been disrupted by the European Union. But he hasn't done it to date. In terms of the, the tax uh, for social care, let's talk about reform of the NHS because you know we have really valued the NHS during COVID. We have bigged it up in terms of the vaccine programme and the fact that people were there when we had a real crisis in terms of the pandemic. But it needs reformed. And there's nobody having that conversation because people on the left, Paul, don't want to have the conversation about reform because when they see reform, they see cuts. And that's why they don't or want Or privatisation. I think, I think that's the problem. As a, as a Conservative, whenever you start speaking about reform. wide-scale reform of the NHS... Oh many on the left do instantly jump down your throat and say, you just want to privatise. Yeah. And it's like, well, no, there may be a place for the private sector in the NHS, but we need to be able to have this debate to figure out uh, what matters most and how uh, we're going to get the best outcomes for patients. The other thing that happened that quite shocked us, I think, and it took a couple of days for it to really come out, was Remembrance Sunday. Yeah. The maternity unit in Liverpool, the, the bomber... Uh, exactly the role of the taxi driver, what happened, was the target the maternity unit, was the target the cenotaph service down the road. We still don't know. Well, I remember speaking to you from Enniskillen that day, of course, Nigel, and uh, I asked to be in Enniskillen that day because I always like to be there given the significance of what happened there 34 years ago. And I could not believe that something like that was happening in Liverpool. It was a real shock. It was. It was, uh, what I find staggering even today is the lack of debate there was after yeah. the incident about the potential motives for what happened and what the effects might have been had the attack been successful. I mean, here you had a person who appeared to have gone to, of all places, a maternity hospital where there were dozens yeah. of women and newborn babies and presumably, and I don't think it's unreasonable to presume it, would, if he could have got out of the car, entered the premises and detonated that that bomb, that explosive, and done the most horrific damage that doesn't bear thinking about. And so to December, the last month of the year, but unfortunately it brought us one of the most horrific stories of the year with little Arthur Labinjo Hughes and the fact that he had been murdered um, by his stepmother, although she wasn't obviously uh, married to his father. Uh, and the father was convicted for manslaughter, 21 years. She was given 29 years. It was a horrific case. Not just the physical abuse, but the psychological abuse that was visited upon this, this little boy of six years of age. Mm -hmm. It was just so very difficult to take in. And it brought us back to the fact that lockdown had an mm. impact on so many young people. They weren't allowed to go to school. They weren't allowed to socialize. 
they weren't subject to interventions that could have been helpful to them. I mean, I'm, I'm a parent and you look at these, I, I found it genuinely difficult to read the detail really of the story. I mean, it was absolutely horrific. Uh, and I saw a poll in the wake of the, the convictions that suggested that 52% of the, the country still believed that capital punishment was an appropriate yeah. response for, for children. Yeah. Yeah. I find it very difficult to say that those people are being unreasonable. <coughs> Actually, I mean, I know capital punishment is a, is a huge debate and there's no chance of it coming back, let's be honest about that. But when you look at the people who visited this pain and suffering mm -hmm. on an innocent child, mm -hmm. does a punishment fit the crime? I don't think it does in this case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think social attitudes have moved on significantly. And I'm, I, I don't think even I'd support it now. I would have done 30 years ago, but I wouldn't now. Even if short term, in emotional response to what people have seen, and a majority say they're in favour. It's, it's a non, it's a non-starter. That's certainly true. But I, I don't like the way that the debate on this subject is skewed by people who oppose a death penalty and think they have a, a monopoly of compassion yes. on mm -hmm. the issue. Oh, yeah. Actually, people who support it, and I get that it's a you know divisive debate. I do understand that. But people who support it support it because they look at cases like this. And they look at people like Ian Huntley, for example, who murdered mm -hmm. those two schoolgirls yes. in Seoul. And they are so moved by the, the yeah. suffering and the trauma of the victims and their families yeah. that they think actually the person who perpetrated that should not be allowed actually to live the rest of their natural life. Right. So, so we, you know, if we're going to have the debate, at least not, let us not do it on the basis that right. one side, i.e. the side who opposes the death penalty, has a monopoly of compassion on yeah. it because I don't think do. But it's but it's December. Come on, it's party time. Uh, <laughs> you know, we've, moved, we've moved a long way from party pool. Well, yeah, I mean, but December twenty twenty was party time, big time, all over Downing Street, Westminster, Conservative Central Office. The country was locked down, but they were going for gold, weren't they? The government, um, indeed. Even reports that the party in central office didn't end until two or three o'clock in the morning. A door was broken, scenes of mass drunkenness, let alone the party on the 18th, uh, which took place in Downing Street, up to 50 attendees, including with certain some quite senior members of the press. Um, Mr Doyle, who is now, you know, the Prime Minister's senior press spokesman, giving out the prizes, secret Santa, wine and cheese. Then we got the 13th of November, the day that Lee Kane and Dominic Cummings get the boot, supposedly, because the wicked Carrie has planned it all. And then that night, Emma Johnson's flat, Carrie hosts a party for 13 people, all completely in breach of the rules. It's party time, it's fabulous. Rest of us can't visit elderly relatives or do anything. Um, and then when they're questioned on it, the Prime Minister just lies and lies and lies again, as if it doesn't matter. And it kind of does matter, doesn't it? The Allegra Stratton, it wasn't just her fault, was it? I mean, she's, no. she's carried the can, but it was cringe-making the whole thing, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But I, I think with Allegra Stratton, she's, she's almost been made a scapegoat of the, of the whole thing. And... I mean, I have to say, I'm uncomfortable with the idea that somebody felt it necessary to, to leak that footage. Because if we we're honest, look, we've all said stuff in private company with our work colleagues that we've had a bit of a laugh and a joke about black humour a little bit that we wouldn't necessarily, I mean, I've done it, we've all done it, that we wouldn't necessarily want to be broadcast on the on the national media. And if it were broadcast on the national yes, media, we'd be, we'd be caught have out. Have we laughed so and joked about breaking the law and getting away with it? Well, I think what she was doing in that situation, and, and by the way, I think the government is guilty of hypocrisy on this. Let me let me say that clearly. But I think what she was doing is she was giving a, a, a sort of a, a press conference, which was a bit of a trial run. And some of her colleagues were firing questions at her. Uh, and one of them said something and she had a bit of a, a joke about it. Oh, was there a cheese and a, and a wine party? That was an off the cuff comment that she thought was said between friends, a sort no, of I remark agree. that we have all made. I so I, I do have sympathy for her because I don't think she necessarily did that maliciously. Okay. And she has carried the can for people higher up who are certainly guilty of hypocrisy. Uh, and it's almost like she's been used as chaff, really, to deflect the, the blame from them. Um, the problem for the government is they have taken this hard line over the last 18 months or so, 
where they've said, you must follow these rules. And they have launched this propaganda blitz and it's been going on for 18 months or more. You must follow, follow these rules. If you don't, you're going to kill granny. You're going to overwhelm the NHS. You're going, to, you, you, you're going to make sure that the NHS isn't able to cope. And then if they are found breaching the same rules that they are drilling into other people they must abide by, what excuse have they got? How can they complain when people then highlight their hypocrisy? That's exactly where we are, I think, with this. How much trouble? How much trouble is the government in? Well, you know, it depends whether his colleagues, and it's his colleagues that are important. Labour can shout, the media can say whatever they want, but it's Boris's colleagues that are key in all of this. So if his colleagues decide that he's still an electoral asset to them, as he was in 2019, and we've talked about the election, uh, then he'll remain. If they decide he's more of a liability, then things will change. I think actually it's in the balance at the moment, at this moment in time, and I think Boris will want to get a grip on, on Downing Street and move the story on to something else. If he can do that, then he'll survive. This time next year, Arlene, will Boris Johnson still be Prime Minister? I think it's in the balance, uh, and I know we're in the, the realms of predictions now. It just depends over the next couple of weeks whether he can get a real grip. Probably oh. not. Probably not. Diana? You are compromised by not, this. Not, not to deflect like politicians do, but the bigger <laughs> question for me, Nigel, is are we going to see a Nigel Farage comeback? Oh, oh, God. You see, I mean, it's genius, isn't it? You know, I'm just Joe we'll Public. Come back some I'm, <laughs> I'm just Joe Public sitting here quietly, you know. And, and quietly. You're you're never quietly. Never <laughs> quietly anywhere. I, I, I have to say, I think that the Conservative Party is in dire trouble. I think it's... Mm. Uh, gone so far away. Here's the tragedy. You know, Brexit, to me, Brexit was the first step of modernising British politics, of revolutionising things, of bringing the country in terms of how we run into the 21st century. And what I see is a Conservative Party who conveniently picked it up because it suited and has decided that the old Etonian set could just go on running the country corruptly the way they have for decades. I think, I think that's a massively unfair representation of the Conservative No, it's worse than that. I agree with you. <laughs> no, and I, absolutely and I, not. And I think when the PPE contracts come out and when we learn where all the money went, the 40 billion on test and trace, I hope a lot of people go to prison, frankly, for wasting billions of pounds of our money. Um, it's the old guard still running it. It's utterly unreformed. The bright hope is the 2019 intake. It's people like you that have come into politics. I've met lots and lots of your colleagues. Some incredible you know, people. You know, and really you've got some great people. people, some real people, came yeah. into politics in these red wall seats in 2019. And that gives me some hope. But the old guard's still in charge. So am I going to come back and give them all a good kicking again and, and teach them a lesson? Well, I got rid of the last prime minister. I helped get rid of the prime minister before that. Uh, we'll have to see. Never say never. You know, I did do it all once before. And that's a threat if ever there was one. It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather.